Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand. Amen. The Bible tells us that this is the day that the Lord hath made. He says, I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Has anybody come to rejoice the good things of the Lord today in your life? Amen. doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but it does mean we know who is perfect. And as long as our hand is in his hand and we're following after him, the Bible says that he will make all the ways perfect in our life. Amen. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today, and I'm glad to be able to worship in spirit and in truth with you. Amen. Well, why don't you turn around and shake somebody's hand. Put a big smile on your face and let them know you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today.
my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, on my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Don't you feel the presence of God this morning? He wants to bless. He wants to manifest. Let's manifest our love for him and our worship and adoration to him. Let's glorify the king this morning. We want you to be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified.
and to honor you and to glorify you. It's not about us, Lord. It's about your great gift that you've given to us. It's not about us, God, but it's about you, exalting you, lifting you, blessing you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness.
Let's worship him together. Let's worship him together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's have a chain reaction of prayer in this place. A chain reaction of worship. Hallelujah. A chain reaction of compassion. A chain reaction of love. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. You may be seated for a moment or two. We're going to stand in a moment again and go to one another and pray for needs. It is our time of prayer right now, and there are several needs that have been submitted this morning. I want to read you a real quick scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Now, if I say now, this, the Lord is that spirit. Say, the Lord is that spirit. And that, if you look in that translation, you'll see it's a capital S, meaning the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Somebody say liberty. Amen. If you're bound by some disease today, God knows how to liberate you from that. Hallelujah. If you're bound by some sort of depression or bad feelings, the Lord knows how to liberate you from that today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're bound in some sort of financial need, the Lord knows how to liberate you from that. Because the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And take this liberty that you're feeling now and take it in your car with you. Hallelujah. When you're driving down the highway, take it to your house. Uh, take it to your dinner table. Take it to your bedtime prayer and your early morning prayer. There is liberty in the Spirit of God and say amen. Amen. God knows how to change things. Amen. Victory Report. Naya, who had surgery this week at Frederick Memorial. It says, Naya's surgery went very well. Praise God and thanks to the saints of God for their prayers, love, and support. That's from Sister Karen Nurse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another one here from Rick Spalding says, Paul Kelly is recovering from a coma and paralysis. God knows how to liberate. Hallelujah. God knows how to change things. He changed that coma. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's fantastic. Amen. So when we pray for one another today, let's believe and and grasp on to the liberty that is in this place. Hallelujah. By the Spirit of the Lord. Not by our might, not by our power, but by His Spirit, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. Good friends of mine, Danny Spears and, and Krista, they have a need, a financial need, a very special need. If anyone could give advice and help as well and pray, they have a tax situation that is a... a pretty daunting. So we want to pray for brother and sister Spears. They have a tax situation. If you know anybody that can help them, they want, they're requesting advice. Amen. All right. We know the Lord can. Amen. Amen. Sophie Scott, this is Angie Crombie's uh, sister. We want to pray for a miracle. Sister Crombie, where are you at? I know you're usually right back. Please stand. God knows how to change things. Amen. God knows how to liberate. Hallelujah. Uh, Andy Garcia says that uh, he is having a backache and needs prayer for a backache. Uh, Julia and Tom Minart, thank you for praying for my co-worker's husband, Tom. His chemotherapy treatment went well. Please continue to pray for Julia and Tom. This is from Becky Vaca. So Julia and Tom. So Becky, if you're here, please stand. Amen. Esther Davis, is, this is a prayer request by Lawrence Davis, is battling cancer. Amen. So if you would stand for Esther's request here of cancer, God knows how to change it. Amen. God knows how to liberate. Praise God. Amen. Miss Dorsey. Miss Dorsey, I think you're right back there. Miss Dorsey, a good friend of mine, she's having pains in her knees. I want some ladies to get around her, ladies of faith, and let's believe that Sister Dorsey's pain in her knees is going to be liberated. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, Rick Spalding for Coretta Jefferson is having knee surgery, and we pray for a full recovery. And then uh, Eddie Garcia again for Anna Dolores going into eye surgery on August 4th. So if you have submitted a request, please stand right now. Please, please stand so we can gather around you. Amen. And we're going to pray for you. 
if you did not get a chance to submit a request, I'd like for you to stand right now, and when people come to pray with you, just share with them what your request is, and they can pray with you in faith. Amen. All right? Saints, you got faith? Is Jesus in this room? Amen. We can feel his presence here. Hallelujah. We know he's here. Let's grasp on to it. Let's go to these folks right now. Go to these folks that need prayer. And again, let's pray in faith and believe together. Praise God. Amen. Let's lift our voices right now. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, Lord God. Thank you for your presence in this building, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence in this building, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the promise of liberty, Lord God. Thank you for the promise of liberty, Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for touching brothers and sisters' spheres. You see their need, Lord God. Touch Danny and Crystal right now. This family, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We need a miracle, Lord God, and you know how to do miracles, Lord God. You know how to do miracles, God. You know how to deliver. You know how to provide liberty in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we lift our voice and our faith to you, Lord God. Uh, we lift our faith to you. We believe it, Lord God. Uh, touch Anna Dolores, Lord Jesus. Touch her in this eye surgery, Lord God. Uh, touch Coretta Jefferson in the knee surgery that she's about to have. Uh, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord God, for touching her, Lord. Uh, touch Miss Dorsey right now in Jesus' name. Touch Miss Dorsey and heal. This knee situation, Lord God, uh, comfort her right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, touch Esther Davis, Lord God. We curse this cancer in Jesus' name. Uh, we curse this cancer. Provide liberty for Sister Esther in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you, Lord God, for touching Julie and Tom, Lord God. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, in the name of Jesus, put your hand on these chemicals, Lord God. And put your spirit even beyond these chemicals in this chemotherapy. And bring liberty in this situation, Lord God. Uh, touch my brother's backache right now in Jesus' name. Uh, totally heal it, Lord God. Uh, bring total liberty to him right now in Jesus' name. Uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Uh, touch Sophie right now. Touch Sophie Scott in Jesus' name. We praise you, Lord God. Uh, we praise you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, lift your hands and thank you for it right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Amen. I wonder if we could continue to stand and one more prayer need. We have so many. So many connections to the country of Venezuela. So many connections to the country of Venezuela. Many, many family members that um, are represented here in our congregation and, and connected over there. Pastors that are connected through um, our family members here. And, and uh, they're in a pivotal moment right now in their country. If you're paying attention to the news, they're in a pivotal moment right now that will determine... Uh, the future of that country. And really, the way the country is right now, the only direction is up. And uh, we, we want God to intervene. How many believe that God's able to intervene and help and touch? Amen. 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 Brother Gomez, your father pastors there in Venezuela. And uh, God knows tomorrow. We don't know tomorrow. God knows tomorrow. And uh, God's able to put a fence around uh, every believer. God's able to change the direction. God's able to do whatever needs to be done that he would be glorified. Why don't we stretch our hands forth right now, and why don't we pray that God would do a work in that country and that he would supply the needs to those people, those precious people. We pray, Lord Jesus, right now by the authority of your word. We know, Lord Jesus, that your creation, Lord God, of humanity 
that it's your best desires, God, that are played out in their life. We submit ourselves to you right now, Lord Jesus, standing in the gap, praying, Lord God, from a distance, but sending forth your blessings and your power to that nation, Lord Jesus. There's corruption, Lord Jesus. There's underhandedness, Lord God. There's deviousness and evil, God. We pray right now against that. We pray, Lord Jesus, that there's a turning, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for all of the believers, Lord, and unbelievers, God, that they would sense their need and deeper need for you, Lord Jesus. We pray, God, that you would continue to supply the needs of every single person in that country. There's lack of medical care. There's lack of food. There's lack of water. There's lack, Lord Jesus, of proper housing. We pray, Lord Jesus, that through your grace and your mercy and empowerment, God, that you begin to turn the wave of the evil in that country, God. Bring liberty and freedom, Lord Jesus. Through your spirit, through your spirit, Lord Jesus, let it be done. Hallelujah, God. In Jesus' name, why don't we give the Lord a hand praise of thanksgiving. Amen, 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 amen. We believe. Amen. Why don't you turn to two people right around you, give them a high five and say, I'm glad I'll go to a church that believes in the power of prayer. Come on, proclaim that to somebody. Not everybody believes in the power of prayer. But I believe in the power of prayer. Hallelujah. Now one more time, give the Lord a hand. Praise. Jesus' name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. You may be seated. This is the fifth Sunday, so all of our classes are in. A lot of travel going on, vacations, wonderful opportunities for people to enjoy their family and time together. We're encouraging you tonight to do that, encouraging you to link up and join uh, one another in fellowship and be a part of something great this afternoon in your life. And uh, we are glad to be back. I say we. We just got back from NAYC 2017. Amen. We had 56 people traveling. Amen. And uh, got back late last night. And uh, services on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Amen. Traveled back on Saturday. And uh, it was almost indescribable. Almost indescribable. We were in, in uh, Indianapolis, Lucas Oil Stadium, 35,000 young people gathered together, worshiping and proclaiming the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. And the theme of that event was taken from the Joel, which was then later reiterated in the book of Acts, where it says, This is that. That in the last days, that God is going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. That was the theme of the whole week, and I believe that not only was our young people's lives changed, but thousands upon thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of lives were changed. And I want you to put it on your calendar right now in 2019. You don't want to miss that event. You don't have to be a young person to go to that event. It could be anybody. It's going to be held in the Dome in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I anticipate that the numbers will only grow from there. Hallelujah. We're glad to have everybody in the house of the Lord. We certainly want to continue to pray for all those that are traveling. We've got a host of people that are traveling, you know, vacations, and uh, we want there to, to have a good time and mercies to be upon them. We're certainly glad. Brother Bill Thompson, I just want to publicly thank you for driving the bus.
Amen. He got us there safe and got us home safe. Hallelujah. And uh, it's not an easy task to take a, a bus full of um, um, what was it full of? Uh, young people, young adults. Actually, it was kind of split evenly between uh, under 18 and over 18. It was, it was a great trip, and I really appreciate Brother Bill working with us and really uh, managing that. He had to take that bus through the city. He, he wasn't able to go to any services because he had to care for the bus and park it and make sure that it was uh, in the proper place and then back at the proper place to pick us up. And uh, the Lord granted him favor. Amen. And uh, really appreciate you, Bill, and all that you did for us. Amen. Amen. And all of the young people and young adults that went on the trip, I certainly, and a lot of you are in choir, certainly want to just reiterate what you heard this week, is that what you got was not just for that location. And what you received was not just for the moment, but it was a life-changing event. It was a turning of a corner in your life. And it's not something to be left behind. It's something to continue to allow grow in your life and mature in your life and to become a part of your life. Amen. And so, once again, we are glad to be in the house of the Lord and glad to be able to worship. And we Welcome everyone that's here today, and if this is your first, second, third, or fourth time being here, we're privileged and we're honored that you joined us to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this house. Amen. Immediately after the service, for your convenience, there is a guest reception set up out our doors to the right here of the sanctuary, and it's there that you can find a bunch of information about uh, what we have to partner with you in regards to your walk with God and relationship building with Him. It's just a casual kind of walk through, uh, in and out. There's some light refreshments there. Uh, we'll be able to introduce ourselves and give you, hopefully, some good information. We have uh, two good paths of biblical education opportunities that uh, you can make yourself available to. One is a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. It's an overview from Genesis to Revelation. It's our discovery class, and it gives you an opportunity at the convenience of time and location that best fits you to get into the Word of the Lord and recognize and understand that there is a purpose for your life. God has that purpose already figured out for you, and it's the best thing for you, and it's in partnership with Him through relationship. And then there's a longer and more in-depth study of the Word of the Lord, and it's called our Journey Class. It's done here on campus, and it's in group setting, and it's there that you can learn uh, more about subjects like prayer, more about subjects like our lifestyle that's pleasing to Him, more about subjects about who is God and who is Jesus and how all that relates to me and my life and my family, both at the information booth in the center of the foyer and in our guest reception. There will be people there that will be able to help you and answer any questions that you might have regarding our youth department ministries, our children's ministries, our Sunday school uh, ministries, and these deeper educational path ministries. And uh, we invite you to that. Amen. It's good to have a whole row here, I think. Uh, brother and Sister Sanchez, where are you, brother? This Brother Sanchez right here in the white shirt? Amen. Uh, brother somebody? Sister? Sister, brother, anybody? I need a translator, I think. Amen. There's, here's a mic. This is all pre-rehearsed. Amen. I think, uh, speak, uh, do they speak English or is it all Spanish? Solo hablan español, hablan un poco de inglés. Solo español. Little, little, that's poquito, poquito. <laughs> Amen. This is brother and sister Sanchez and family. Son la familia Sanchez, hermano y hermana Sanchez con su familia. And they are, hang on. They are from Colombia. Son colombianos. And they have been sent from Colombia and are missionaries to the country of Spain. Los han enviado desde Colombia como misioneros al país de España. And they have been missionaries 
in the country of Spain for five years. Han estado en el país de España por cinco años como misioneros. And they have a lot of family and friends that are here in the Maryland area. Y ellos tienen muchos amigos y familiares que viven aquí en Maryland. And we just want to say welcome. We love you. Queremos darle la bienvenida. Les amamos. And we honor you for your work that you're doing. Y le damos el honor por su trabajo como misioneros. I think that's incredible that there's missionaries from other countries going to other countries. ¿Cuántos creen que es increíble que haya misioneros de otros países que van a otros países? Because it's going to be the whole gospel. Porque va a ser el puro evangelio. To the whole world. A todo el mundo. Through the whole church. A través de la iglesia. Amen. Amen. God bless you. El Señor les bendiga. We welcome you. Le damos la bienvenida. Amen. We want to go to the Lord with our giving this morning and allow him to be a part of our life through the obedience of honoring him through our substance. The Bible speaks very clearly, very definitively, that we have become stewards of what he has given us, what he has allowed us to be a part of. And the Bible just requires, through obedience, first fruits in return. And you know what? I don't know about you, but I certainly have recognized that I do a whole lot better when I give God what he deserves with what I have left over. I do a whole lot better with that. Amen. Is there anybody in the building that could wave your hand and say and testify that when I'm in obedience to him in all areas of my life, my finances included, that my life's path is just more smooth? Hallelujah. doesn't mean there's not going to be a bump in the road. It doesn't mean there's not going to be a little twist and a turn. But when I am following him and obeying him, it's just so much better in my life. Amen. It's not that we are giving to get. Nope. That's not the biblical explanation of offering. It's an honoring unto the Lord and obedience unto him. And it's how his ministry and operation is actually facilitated here. And so we honor him this morning with our giving. In front of each section is an offering basket. Our ushers do have envelopes for needs of designation purposes and financial accountability at the end of the year for you and your family. Amen. Our ushers will guide us. We will bring our gifts to the Lord, and then we will pray over our gifts after we have received them, pronouncing God's blessings in our life as a result of our obedience to Him. Amen. Amen. If you're ready to give, why don't we stand this morning? Amen. Amen. Is the Lord good? Amen. Amen. I encourage you this morning to just join the flow. And when you join the flow, if you don't have something to give or you're not prepared to give today, and I'm certainly if you're a guest, we're not asking you to participate in this. But I encourage everyone to join the flow. Because once you get into the flow, it makes such a difference in your life. Just getting in the flow makes a big difference. It's rough when you are pushing against the flow. But when you get in the flow, man, it's smooth. Whew. Amen. So as our musicians play, our ushers are guide us, let's get in the flow and bring our gifts to the Lord this morning.
if you would please stretch forth your hand towards these offering pans, and let's ask the Lord to bless this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the giving of your people. Thank you, Lord God, for multiplying this, using it to your glory. Thank you for your people's giving today in Jesus' name. And someone say amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many is thankful for the power of Jesus this morning? Thank you, Jesus. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. Worship with us as we sing about the overcoming power of Jesus.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hold on. Praise the Lord. I've had something on my heart since last Sunday. It's a scripture that I'd like to share with you. It's one of the minor prophets. It's Nahum. You don't hear much about Nahum. But if we could bring up on the screen Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. I was out of town last weekend and I was in another church worshiping the Lord with another group and the pastor brought up this scripture and it's, it's a powerful scripture. If we could read it together, let's read it together. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble and he knoweth them that trust in him. Isn't that powerful? That's why we can be an overcomer. That's why we can overcome. Amen. Because he is a stronghold in a day of trouble. And you know something else? He knows those that put their trust in him. So he knows exactly what you're dealing with. And he's going to bring you through. Hallelujah. And that was made.
anybody believe that he's alive today? Amen. He is alive. He's not dead. He's not in the tomb. But he's alive and well. And he's ready, willing, and able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think by the power and the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you glad? Once you give him a hand praise this morning if you're glad that he is alive today. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord and experiencing his presence today. Today is a fifth Sunday, so all of our children that are not on vacation with their families are in the sanctuary. We welcome our children uh, in the sanctuary today. We're glad that they're here. Amen. A little more responsibility to moms and dads. We recognize that and uh, appreciate your efforts bringing everyone is I think it's important that our children experience the sanctuary and are a part of these services amen get your Bibles if you will and turn to the book of Joshua chapter 24 I do want to say uh, just how privileged we've been my family has been over the last little while uh, to be able to have my sister in town and my sister lives currently in Singapore with her family and it worked out that she's been able to be here and it's been a blessing specifically due to my grandmother's uh, time and, and uh, her condition and um, also it's been very nice to have my niece, my sister's daughter Emma who has just finished her first year at Rice University and will be they both will be leaving today, and she'll be starting her second year in Rice University. And Emma, my niece, and Joy, my sister, are so glad that you're here today. Amen. Love them very much. Joshua chapter 24. Her plane leaves at 2.30, and she asked me to preach a five-minute message so we could have lunch together. I said, not a problem. It may take me a lot longer, but it will be a five-minute message. Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 14. It's a little bit of a lengthy reading. The Bible says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me, everybody say me. me, and my house, say my house, we will serve the Lord. Verse number 16, and the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And they continued to talk about the Lord's goodness and the Lord drave out them before us, all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, <laughs> he said, ye cannot serve the Lord, for he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. And he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if ye forsake 
the Lord and serve strange gods. Then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He says, Okay. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. The people said, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. For my five minute message that will take us about 45 minutes, I'd like to just preach and you preach with me. As for me and my house, because somebody in here has got to make a decision, somebody in here has got to make a choice. Now, you may be in charge of your house, or you may be in charge of multiple people in your house, but everybody in here has got to make a decision about your house. Joshua called the people to make a decision about their house, and he let them know, as far as he was concerned, that he and his house We're going to serve the Lord. Let's put our Bibles down. And one more time, let's give the Lord a rounding applause of appreciation. He's a good God. He's a mighty God. Come on, do you believe He's a good God today? He's a mighty God. Amen, and I believe. Hallelujah. I wonder, is there anybody that can wave a hand and say, God's been good to me? Come on, is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, I can point out time and time and time again that God has been faithful and God has come through and God has done the miraculous and God has done the marvelous. I can take you to the day. I can take you to the moment. I can take you to the place. I can remember the prayer that I prayed when God came through for me and my family. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Turn to your neighbor before you're seated and tell him, as for me and my house. Now tell him, say, I'm not just going to, I'm not just going to tell you. Come on, tell him, say, I'm not just going to tell you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to put some feet to my words. I'm not going to be just all talk. But I'm going to have some action. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture in which we have entered in here to today and Joshua the timing of his life is coming to a close in this passage of scripture we recognize that Joshua is now quite elderly and he has seen a lot in his lifetime we know that his early formative years were spent in service to the great liberator that we know as Moses. His later years were spent leading God's people prominently into the battle that they were able to possess the promised land as a result of. As we look over the life of Joshua, he has seen the plagues of Egypt. 
He saw the parting of the Red Sea. He experienced the trip through the desert all the way to the edge of the promised land. And then he had to experience the trip back into the desert for another 40 years of wilderness wandering, the Bible calls it. He saw God part the Jordan River. He experienced the crumbling walls of Jericho. He saw the enemies of the Lord being sent in panic. He saw the punishment of Achan after his sin of disobedience and the restoration of blessing and presence of God as a result of obedience. And now he is an elderly man. He's led a full life. The Bible says that he has been strong. He's been courageous as God has commanded him to be. If we were to look at him physically, he's got the scars from a hundred battles that he's fought. He recognizes and he knows the power and the presence of God in his life and through his leadership. And now he recognizes that his death is very near. So, so he gathers his people together. He summons the leaders and he gives his final address. This is where we come into the scripture. We read the recordings of this conversation, this address to his leaders. And we see that if we were to, we didn't have time, and we don't have time to actually go through a theological exegesis of the scriptures, but we can see that there are sections of this encounter. The first section recounting the mighty things of God and what God has done for his people and he explains it and rehearses it and talks about coming out of Egypt and talks about the freedom from bondage and talks about where God is brought them from. I think it's good every now and then to just remember that I'm not where I used to be in life. Come on somebody. I, every now and then it's good to look back and say, man, I was messed up. I was going nowhere. I was headed in the wrong direction. As a matter of fact, there was nothing but a brick wall in front of me and when I met Jesus and I gave my life to him, man, he, boom, took me on a 90 degree angle and Man, I'm much better than I was with Christ than I was without Christ. Can anybody testify that God has brought you a mighty long way? And he begins to affirm that God has not only promised them, but that he has fulfilled promises in their life. And then he transitioned to a call to commitment. Here on his deathbed, Joshua reminds the people that we wouldn't be in this land if it wasn't for God. We wouldn't have experienced all that we've experienced if it wasn't for God. We wouldn't be free if it wasn't for God. We wouldn't feel the liberating power of ownership if it wasn't for God. Our children wouldn't be able to experience what they're experiencing if it wasn't for God. Come on, somebody, do you understand what I'm saying? And Joshua says, don't forget, don't forget that what you are and what you have is not on our own means. But it's only through the mercy and the grace and the power of God in our life. He says we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. We'd still be in bondage 
working for somebody else, but we're not working for anybody else. We're working for ourselves now. He says, if it wasn't for God, he says, but you cannot have that unless you have a commitment in your life, he's saying. And he recalls his people to a commitment. And he says to them, I want you to fear. Somebody say fear. And that's not be afraid of. That's not, that's not tremble. That's not cower. That's not uh, put the covers over your head kind of fear. It's reverence. I want you to be reverent to the Lord. I want you to honor him. He's saying, I want you to honor the Lord and I want you to be reverent to the Lord and I want you to serve him with all, the Bible says, faithfulness. See, what, what was happening is that the children of Israel, you know, humanity hadn't changed very much. Can somebody say amen? amen? Humanity hadn't changed very much. He says, I want you to serve God with all faithfulness. The children of Israel, they are a perfect parallel of humanity today. If you were to read the accounts of the children of Israel, you would find them from Egypt to the promised land and beyond. You would find that, man, our life parallels their life. God does a great thing. He does a great thing today. He's done a great thing today. How many can wave your hand and say, I'm glad I came to church today? <laughs> He's done a great thing today, and he did great things for them. And then by Tuesday of their life, like our life, we don't even remember who God is. How many has been there before? Oh, but just a couple hands. Hallelujah. He says, I want you to reverent God. And I want you to serve him. And I want you to serve him with all faithfulness. He goes on, he says, I'm calling you to throw away all the other gods. And I'm calling you to make a choice to serve only one God. And I need you to pick who that one God is. This is what he's saying to the people. He's saying you got too many things in your life. You got too many, too many little G's in your life. And you can't really get yourself focused and you can't get yourself moving in a direction with so many voices and so many callings in your life. He says, I need you to focus and I need you to throw away all of the other gods and make a choice to serve God alone. The call is not any different for us today as it was for Joshua in those days. The same question, whom are you going to serve? is the same question that you and I have to answer in our life on a daily basis. Who am I going to serve today? Whom am I going to give my allegiance to today? Who's going to influence me today? Who am I going to follow today? Who is going to cause me to make decisions today? He says, you need to determine who your God is. Oh, someone turn to somebody and say, you need to determine today. Come on, tell them. Say, you need to determine today. We find that the children of Israel, it was relatively easy. Somebody say, it was easy. Everybody say, it was easy for the Israelites to worship other gods. We find it all through the scriptures. They drift over to this God. They drift over to that God. And God would have to bring them back together again. God would have to kind of get them lined up again. But it was easy to serve other gods. Just like it's easy today to serve other gods. Why was it easy for the children of Israel to serve other gods? It's the same reason it is today. They don't demand very much. Other gods don't demand very much from you. It's easy to 
carry a little wooden carving and say, this is my God. It's easy as the children of Israel to throw some grain down at the feet of a statue, bow to the sun, say a few lines, and then go on with your life. There's not much requirements from the other God. It was easy, easy, easy. But God, God demands everything. He tells you, he he's a jealous God. He don't like it when you're flirting with other gods. He's a jealous God. He don't like it when he finds out you're two-timing him. He said he's a jealous God. He don't like it when he finds out you're spending uh, Friday night with one of the other gods. He, he, wants, he wants you and he wants all of you for himself, he says. Joshua, maybe in his old age, he's getting a little less patient with people. He lays it out pretty bluntly for them, as he had been doing really his whole ministry. He says, you either serve the Lord with all faithfulness, he says, or choose some other God to serve. My wife put it so eloquently, I believe it was last Sunday. She said, riding the fence hurts. I don't care who you are. Straddling the fence hurts. Come on, somebody, tell me it hurts. <laughs> Relief comes from either side of the fence. Joshua saying, look, you're making all of us miserable riding the fence. It's that lukewarmness that God doesn't like. He says, I'd rather you be on this side of the fence or that side of the fence. Don't be in this confusing middle part of the fence. My wife said, you're going to get relief if you go to the wrong side of the fence. It'll be a relief for a little while because you're off the fence. So many people, when they choose to move away from God and they get off the fence and they move away from relationship with God, they say, wow, man, that's, I feel so much better. Of course you do. You're off the fence. But it doesn't take very long to realize this side of the fence is lacking a whole lot. The Bible says that there is pleasures in sin, but it's only for a... So I'm not going to lie to you and say that living in the world and living sinful life doesn't have its pleasures and it's not fun. It is fun and there is pleasures, but it's short-lived. Joshua is saying, you got to get off the fence. And you need to either serve the Lord with all faithfulness, you need to choose which God you're going to serve. Hey, what was he saying? Don't come to church on Sunday and worship and shout and dance and then go and live for the other gods all the rest of the week. It's a whole lot easier serving other gods. They don't demand too much. But I need you to know, they don't offer very much either. So Joshua says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And he finishes sort of his tenure of leadership of that day and he reminds them as he has shown them for his whole life. As for me and my house, we. He made it a collectiveness. He said, I'm in charge of this house. And this house is going to serve the Lord. 
I want you to notice that there was a standard to serving the Lord that Joshua inserted. He said, it's going to be with all faithfulness. He doesn't leave room for casual faith. He doesn't leave room for when it's convenient or when things are going well or when life is easy or when it makes the best benefit for your flesh. He does not leave any room except for all faithfulness unto the Lord. He calls his people and as the word of the Lord then as it is now is just as relevant. We are called to serve the Lord with all, everybody say all, all. faithfulness. We may ask ourselves, well, what if there's no reward to this, this thing? What if there's no appreciation, gold star for faithfulness? What if there's nothing but opposition in my life? When I make a decision to serve the Lord with all faithfulness, what if nobody says anything? <laughs> like, good job. Thank you. What if nobody notices that I'm serving the Lord with all faithfulness? I've had an enjoyable week catching up with old friends. I've had an enjoyable week reminiscing over the years of these conferences. And I've had conversations while I was gone on the phone and email correspondence and text messaging correspondences. Had plenty of time for that 10-hour bus ride <laughs> waiting for the young people to come downstairs from the hotel rooms waiting for them to get to the bus after the services, waiting for them to be done at Denny's. Some of these conversations have made me excited about living for God in this present day. Some of those conversations have me longing for the trumpet to sound. When the Bible says that all of the struggles and pains and difficulties and unfairness of life will be over. Boy, won't that be a day. Hallelujah. Won't that be a day when we cross over and there's no more pain and no more sorrow? But Joshua recognized the struggles. He'd lived through more struggles than any of us have ever dreamed about living through. I mean, you can't even, we cannot comprehend the ultimate struggle that he had to endure by knowing the direction that his people should go and his people turning their back on God and Joshua having to live in 40 years of wilderness wandering. How disappointing is that? No gold stars for you going over and saying, We're, we can do it, God's well able to take the land. But through it all, what he was saying is he was saying that all the struggles, all the disappointments, all of the turning the backs on God, he says it's worth it. This faithfulness thing. When nobody else sees it, it's worth it. When there's nobody marking down on a chart somewhere that you're faithful, he says it's worth it. When everybody is in opposition against me, it's worth it. He says, I'm going to serve God with all faithfulness because it's worth it. Not because anybody gives me a clap on the back. Not because anybody has me stand up and acknowledges me. Not because everybody says I'm doing a great job. I do this because it's worth it. It's worth going to bed at night and having a peaceful night's rest. It's worth getting up in the morning and knowing that God's in charge of everything. It's worth it when you call on his name, you know he's going to answer you. It's worth it when he's got everything mapped out in your life. And if I follow him, uh, I'm going to have success. It's worth it. Faithfulness 
is worth it every single time. I said every single time, it's worth it. It's not worth it when I mess up. It's not worth it when I choose a different direction. It's not worth it when I take the pleasures of sin and I just live in it for a season. It's not worth it, but faithfulness is worth it. Faithfulness is worth it. It's not worth it when I make a bad choice. It's not worth it when I go in the wrong direction. It's not worth it when I'm in opposition. It's not worth it when I got an attitude. It's not worth it when I hate my brother. But faithfulness to God is worth it. It's worth it. You'll be glad you did it. Even though it can be tough sometimes. Even though the alternatives seem to be so much easier and more convenient, the best road is the road of serving God with all, everybody say all, all. faithfulness. Of course, the people responded appropriately. As we all respond appropriately in group session. And we get the expected reply, and I get the re expected reply. How many want to serve God with all faithfulness? Yeah. yeah. How many? Come on, somebody. Come on. Okay. I didn't know if you heard me. That's what I expected. Most of you raised your hand. And I expected the ones that didn't to not. We get in the book of Joshua the expected reply, as we do in this setting, the expected reply. And they said, we won't serve any other gods. They said, we know how much God has done for us. And then they themselves list a few of the things that they count as miraculous in their life and they conclude by saying we will serve him only it's what's expected it's what Joshua was calling them to do and then we find that Joshua responds to their expected answer after spending an entire chapter actually his entire life trying to get the Israelites to commit to serving to God and after getting the affirmative answer he was seeking, Joshua says, you are not able to serve the Lord. That's what old people do. They tell it exactly like it is. And Joshua gives them two reasons that they are not going to be able to do what they just said they would do. He says, number one, God is holy. And he says, number two, God is jealous. You know, up until now, we've been focusing on what God has done. And we've been proclaiming through this reading the goodness of the Lord and what he's done for us. And suddenly the focus shifts on who God is. First it was God did this and God did that. And then the other day God did this thing. And now it's God is holy and God is jealous. He says, you're not able to serve him because God's character and his attributes, they're far beyond our comprehension and they are far beyond our ability to understand and manage. He says, God is holy. And by definition, that means that God is distinct. He's unfathomable. He's beyond, he's so morally perfect that we cannot hope to have anything of merit to offer him. He says, you can't serve him. You say you want to, but you can't. 
because he's holy. He's also jealous. Meaning that God's love for his people is so strong and so perfect that he will not accept anything less than total commitment, total fidelity, and all faithfulness. Joshua, he's trying to get the people's attention in his final moments of his life for them to recognize that they need to shift from a God who does stuff for them to a God who is holy and jealous for their love to him. He's trying to get them to see that if they're simply going to say, yep, we'll serve God, he does stuff for us, that that won't sustain them through the difficult times. If they're like, yeah, I remember God did something for me the other day. I hope he does it again. I'll serve him as long as that's happening. That that's not going to help them through times of struggle and testing and times when it looks like God is a million miles away from them. I think you understand the difference, right? You know what it's like to be in a place of struggling or testing, wondering why God isn't stepping in and rescuing you. Why isn't God doing anything for me? Let me tell you something. If your Christian service is based on God's actions and not on God's character, then we will always waver in our allegiance and how we respond, and it will be according to our current circumstances. Maybe I need to repeat that. If our Christian service and relationship is based on God's actions and not his character, then we will always be straddling the fence, wondering if, should I serve God today? Is he going to do anything for me today? Should I serve him tomorrow? Maybe he'll do something for me tomorrow. That is immaturity and it will never result in anything positive in your life. Joshua's call to them, when he told them, you're not able to serve God. It was a call to a deeper commitment and understanding. Not to base your decisions on God's actions but to base your decision on God's character. A relationship based on who God is and not on what God does. Because God's character never changes. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He might not always heal you, but he is always God to you. He might not always supply what you think you need in your life, and if I base my God experience on what I think I need, I'm always going to be disappointed because there's not a God anywhere that's going to be able to supply what we think we need in our life. He was holy in Joshua's time. He's holy in our time. He was jealous in Joshua's time. And he's jealous in our time. Joshua is saying, God is so much more than just giving out a healing and giving out a blessing and giving out a financial uh, blessing and giving out uh, a way where there seemeth to be no way and giving out a door. Oh, he does all that stuff. He does, but that's not why I serve him. I don't serve him because of that stuff. I serve him because he created me in his image uh, and created me to be in relationship with him and created me to show forth uh, his glory and to be the expressed image uh, of an invisible God and so the only way that I can do that is to serve him and love him in all, all, A-L-L, -L, all faith.
faithfulness. I've got nothing that he needs. I've got nothing that will make him more complete. But he has everything that makes me a complete person. And I can't serve him with all faithfulness by just saying, I'll serve him. Because words, as we know, are cheap. So, what hope do we have? <laughs> Why not just... Why not just say, forget it? My goodness. Why not just say, why bother with this? Seems pretty intense. Why? If I'm not able to serve God, then why ask me to commit to serving Him? Joshua told the people, you can't serve Him. No, He's holy and jealous. Impossible. We can't serve Him on our own. We won't last if we simply try to serve him because of the things he's done, as mighty and miraculous and as perfect as they are. But here's the heart of the whole gospel of Jesus Christ and the serving through relationship. We can only serve a holy and jealous God because he has called us and we respond to the calling. And he has invited us out of darkness into his marvelous light by his grace. And we respond to it by action, not by verbal words. I can't do it by myself. I can't be faithful by myself. I can't serve him with all faithfulness by myself. I can't live for him on Monday and Tuesday by myself. I can't do it on Thursday and Friday by myself. There's too many little G's running around trying to get my attention and trying to get my allegiance, uh, and I can't do it by myself. I need something bigger than me that gives me the ability and gives me the opportunity, so I need to respond to the invitation. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 simply says that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This is the key to serving God with all faithfulness, is that I don't do it by myself that I do it through Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I can't serve God on my own. I can't be faithful to God on my own. I can't love God with all of myself on my own. But through Jesus Christ, who gives me the strength, I can do all things. I can be a witness because he strengtheneth me to be a witness. I can be faithful to him because he gives me the strength to be faithful to him. I can be, a, I can be an example because he gives me the strength uh, to be an example. My flesh is weak. Uh, my desires are wrong. Uh, my inclinations are worldly. But when I have given myself over to the invitation uh, into relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, he empowers me uh, to do what I couldn't do all by myself. He says, so I need you to commit. I need you to commit to all faithfulness unto him. He says, I need you to choose which invitation you're going to respond to. He says, I need you to recognize that there is a call that's going out, and the call comes from multiple places. 
He says, you know what God has done for you. You know what his abilities are. But you know what his demand is also. You can't compartmentalize your life and have one box of God in it. Because God is a jealous God. And he doesn't put up with two time in him. He says you can't live your life to please your flesh because you can't be in relationship with a holy God and live a dirty life. He says, so I need you to choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve God with all faithfulness? Knowing that you can't do it on your own. Knowing that God is holy and a jealous God. Knowing that I've got to get to my knees every single day and say, God, I can't do this by myself. If I'm going to serve you today with all faithfulness, I need the empowerment of your spirit in my life. If I'm, going to, if I'm going to raise a family that's going to be pleasing unto you, I can't do it by myself. I've got to have you in my life. I've got to have the influence of you in my life. I've got to block out the influences of all the other gods. I've got to block out the influences of all of my fleshly desires, my inclinations uh, of my humanity. Uh, he says, if I'm going to serve God with all faithfulness, I need to serve him with all faithfulness. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be battles. It isn't going to be easy. It's not always going to be pleasant. There's going to be toil involved. There's going to be difficulty involved. There's going to be a cost involved. I know I'm not making this attractive, but I want you to know that when you don't live for God, there's going to be struggles involved. There's going to be battles involved. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be pleasant. You're going to have to toil in life. There's going to be difficulties and there's going to be a cost. You've got to determine and I've got to determine what cost am I willing to pay by the God in whom I'm choosing to serve. And Joshua says, when you serve God with all faithfulness, that's when you come out of bondage. That's when uh, the Red Sea opens up. That's when the bitter waters of Mara turn to sweet. That's when, uh, when the enemy comes in and starts biting on you and you look up into the heavens, uh, then the enemy has got to scatter. That's when the Jordan River gets crossed over. That's when uh, the walls of Jericho come down. That's when you occupy cities you didn't build uh, and you have vineyards you didn't plant and you have cattle that you didn't raise. Uh, there is a cost but there's also a reward. Let's stand this morning. Jesus makes the same call in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 24 when Jesus said unto his disciples, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and let him follow me. There's an invitation, but there's a cost to the invitation. To our flesh, it doesn't sound attractive. To our humanity, it sounds very restrictive. Why would you choose this? Why would you choose this God Instead of an easier route, an easier God. Why serve a holy and jealous God when it's so much easier to serve a self-serving God? To live life according to our own desires instead of yielding control over to Him and allowing Him to guide us and direct us. Number one, because the relationship with God is worth it. It is so worth it. It's like being a parent. I'm so privileged to have two children. I am grateful to have Martin and Rain in my life. I choose that route. 
I could give up on them. I could throw them to the curb. I could say you're a big pain in the neck, both of you. I could say you don't do what I ask you to do, when I ask you to do it, how I ask you to do it. There's a cost to being faithful. And in the end, it's worth it. The second reason is, just like a parent, and I can't get it over to them just like God can't get it over to us, I know what's best. And I know what's best better than you know what's best. The second reason to choose God is because He knows what's best. How many times have you told your kids, I've been down the road. Don't go there. It's a dead end. There's a cavern. There's a brick wall. You're going too fast. You're going to hit it. The third reason is I know that even when the most difficult life situations are happening, with God in my life, it's going to be full of more joy and purpose than without God in my life. And then the fourth and last reason that I choose God is that I have a steadfast hope for an eternity in heaven with Him. There's no other place that I'd rather be than in His presence. And I cannot afford to jeopardize that at all. I don't like the alternative to eternity in heaven with God. Now, I don't know where you are this morning in your life. I don't know if you've made a weekend decision to serve God. If you've made a lifetime decision to serve God or you've made just a section of life decision to serve God. I don't know if you've made it with conditions or you've made it complete and without condition. Or I don't know if you're one that would stand with Joshua and you would say affirmatively with authority that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's something that each of us have to do at some point in our life. Martin and Rain, there's going to be a day that you're not in my house, so to speak. And whereas right now I can make some very, very clear and strong decisions for you, there's going to be a day that you're going to have to make this decision for yourself. Just like the rest of us in this room, the influences in our life largely determine the decisions that we make. And I pray that the influence that I've been on my children will give them the fortitude and the desire that when they're on their own and they have to make their own decisions that they will decide to serve God with all faithfulness. But that's my house. What about your house? What about you as an individual? Is the word all in there or is it some? Is it completely or is it partial? I don't know if it works this way, but I don't want a partial God because I serve a partial God. I don't want a partial response from God because I give Him a partial part of my life. I want an all God because I give Him an all me. In my life. Scripture doesn't leave room for sitting on the fence. 
God in the flesh walked among us and said, I would rather that you would be hot or cold. He says, but because you are lukewarm, I'm going to have to spew you out of my mouth. God asks for our all. And we have to give a response. Today's family day. I wonder if whatever, whatever your current situation is, if you're a single person, then that you're your family. If you have family in this room, then I'm going to wonder, wonder if you as a family, whether it's a single person or you have a wife or a husband here or you have kids here, I wonder if there's anybody that's willing in the next five minutes, we're a little late, next five minutes would come down to the front and make a ultimate commitment that as far as we're concerned, we're going to serve God with all faithfulness. I wonder, can we make that commitment today? Is there anybody willing to come down to the front with your family, holding hands? Maybe if you're single, you link up with somebody near to you. Come on, come all the way down. Amen. Let's get down close. Down close, all the way. Toes to the, toes to the altar. Toes to the altar. Let's go. Amen. Because God is making the same call to us today as He made through Joshua to the children of Israel. Fill in all the gaps. Fill in all the gaps. We want to get as many people in here as they want, as want to. As many people as they want to. Fill in the gaps. All the way down. That's right. Fill in the gaps. Fill in the gaps. That's right. We want as many people spread out all the way across the front, all the way across the front, as, as close as you can, as close as you can. We want, we want all of our families, everybody that wants to make this commitment today that's able. If you're unable to move, I understand. If you're unable, I understand. It's not a problem. We want, we want you to feel the privilege, the privilege to be and do. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. This is a turning point for somebody in this room. This is a turning point for somebody in this room. This is not, this is not just a sermon. This is a calling. This is a calling to every single one of us that when we leave here, that we're getting rid of all the other gods and we're choosing the one God. Now with your family, with their hands, let's lift our hands to heaven. If you're able to, with your family. And why don't we make a personal commitment and then I'll pray over us. Come on, let's make a personal commitment right now in Jesus' name. God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's make a personal commitment. Come on. Make a personal commitment in Jesus' name. God, I'm making a personal commitment in Jesus' name. That's right. Come on, speak it out to Him. Speak it out to Him. I'm making a personal commitment, God. We're making a commitment. We're bringing the word all into our faithfulness. Come on, tell them, say, I'm bringing the word all. I'm bringing the word all. All is a big word, but Lord Jesus, we recognize the benefits to all. All, Lord Jesus. All, Lord Jesus. All faithfulness, Lord Jesus. All faithfulness, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be faithful, Lord God. I want to be faithful, Lord Jesus. I want my house to be faithful, Lord Jesus. I want to be faithful, our house to be faithful, Lord God.
thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Lord Jesus, we pray right now. We pray, Lord God, over our homes, our families, Lord Jesus. Individuals, Lord God, that are willing to take a stand, to step out, Lord God, make a proclamation of allegiance unto you, Lord Jesus. This allegiance, Lord God, is not an allegiance that's just of convenience. This allegiance, Lord God, is not an allegiance of just on the weekends, God. But this, Lord God, is a lifestyle of faithfulness unto you. You've called us to make a choice and a decision. Whom are we going to serve? And Lord Jesus, we are choosing to serve you in all faithfulness in our life. God, I pray right now that you would give every individual the desire, the power, and the authority through your spirit to serve you beyond the capacity of our flesh, beyond the capacity of our desires, fleshly desires, our humanity, Lord God, but Lord, through a supernatural experience of relationship with you, that you would cause us to transcend above our earthly things and recognize a relationship with you of faithfulness. I pray for all of our homes. I pray, Lord God, that it would not be by verbal action only, but by decisions that result in faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you desire that and embrace that, why don't you just give the Lord a resounding hallelujah and a praise unto Him. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Now that may, may, that may mean some decisions have to be made. That may mean some other gods have got to go away. But I am choosing today to serve the Lord. God bless you. Shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck. If you're a guest, we invite you to our guest reception. We love each and every one of you. No service tonight, no life group tonight. Spend time with your family. Enjoy. God bless you. We love you.